welcome. Uh, this is uh, um, both my uh, hosting my first seminar, uh, chairing my first seminar since becoming director for the Center of Southeast Asian Studies at uh, SOAS, University of London. I'm Professor Michael Charney. Um, we, uh, but it's also an experiment because we're trying for one of the first times to hold our seminars, uh, hold our seminars earlier in the day so they match up with time zones in Southeast Asia. Uh, we won't do all of our seminars like that, but we're going to try for the next couple to reach out to a Southeast Asian audience. So it should be evening time in various uh, across the region, whether it's six, seven, eight, and so on. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to reach more people in that way. Uh, today, our topic is uh, we're going to have two speakers on Thailand, uh, dealing with Thailand from long lasting coup to another short lived or another short lived um, election. Uh, the uh, we're going to they're going to discuss the political situation in Thailand uh, following the uh, the coup in 2014, the subsequent transfer to a military backed civilian regime, and the anticipated general election. Uh, they'll discuss, among other things, the constitutional issues regarding the Senate structure and uh, put in place following the coup in, of 2014 the latest key decisions by the Constitutional Court, uh, which allowed the former Army General turned Prime Minister. Uh, Prayut uh, Chanocha to remain de facto in power for more than eight years and possible shifts in the country's um, power dynamics. Our first speaker uh, is uh, Verapat Pariya Wong, who teaches classes on Thai constitution and politics at SOAS since uh, joining the School of Law as a visiting scholar in 2015. Uh, Verapat coordinates the uh, Rule of Law in Thailand project hosted by the Center for Law in Asia uh, at SOAS and previously served as special counsel to the deputy prime minister of uh, Thailand. And I also have to add, I, I believe that the Center for Law in Asia is also co-sponsoring this. So it's not just a Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, our other speaker uh, will be uh, Pravit uh, Rojana Pruk, uh, who's a senior staff writer at Kalsod English one of Thailand's main English language online news outlets. Uh, Pravit is a highly experienced and outspoken journalist with expertise covering political and social issues in Thailand. And uh, Pravit will be joining us remotely through Zoom. So our first speaker will be here in the room. And our second speaker will be uh, 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 remotely through, uh, through this uh, Zoom function. So I'd like to invite uh, Verpat to, uh, to speak first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah, Professor Shani and Vera Patria Wong. This is actually, uh, as well, my uh, first return to the actual physical setting at SOAS. I've been teaching at SOAS for uh, almost eight years now. And over the past few years with the COVID lockdown, it's very, very uh, strange to have to teach the classes and look at the screens to, to, to try to see the eyes of the students. So I'm very glad that at least today, although we have the webinar functions, we still have uh, some students joining us today. And hopefully those who cannot join us today will be able to watch this recording. So let me start with the um, going through the legal landscape that we have been um, dealing with in Thailand over the past uh, 10 to 20 years. I still remember quite vividly how the first coup in my lifetime, the coup of um, um, 2006, uh, I was a, a law student at university and was so angry, so upset. And I wrote a, a lengthy email to my, to my fellow student friends, how, how could this have happened? And, and we thought things would have changed. Um, unfortunately, it changed, but not in a better way. So let's start and have a quick review, a quick recap. So we came quite a long way um, since our first written constitution in 1932. Some people could argue this is actually the first coup, the first changing of the political and legal regime in Thailand from absolute monarchy to a starting point of what we try to achieve uh, as a constitutional monarchy. Whether that had been achieved, of course, is up to, to debate. But since then, and the next slide is the favorite slide that usually raise the eyebrows among the students uh, when I teach class on Thai constitution and Thai politics. Because if you look on the screen, uh, for following the first uh, Siamese revolution, or the, some people may argue the first coup 
um, to change from the absolute monarchy into um, the more modern day democracy or the aspire democracy. Uh, we are looking at a long list of military coups or sometimes the, the co-opted co coups by civilians. And not just that, we also have the failed attempts, the attempts that did not realize. So this is quite a staggering uh, world record. I'm not sure if somebody has, has been keeping the record for Thailand. And I usually ask the, the, the students that each time we had a, a, a coup that leads to a new paper that we call constitution. Should we call this a constitution? Because it actually should be some, something that constitutes a, a stable political and legal regime, or whether this is something that I would call a coup situation to constitute something through coups, and it keeps changing back and forth. So this is the political reality that we are dealing with today. And, and as, as it happened, I was so angry as a, as a law student studying law uh, at Chulalongkorn University back in 2000, uh, 2006, and many years later, practicing as a lawyer and also advisor to government, I remember vividly again uh, on the 22nd of May 2014 when my article was published on the front page uh, newspaper of Tairat and Matishu newspaper. Suddenly, in the same afternoon, the, um, the prime minister, uh, the acting ministers, um, and the key cabinet uh, members were arrested, basically taken into uh, custody uh, after being invited to attend a meeting with um, the famous slash infamous General Prayutta Nosha, who staged the coup. And pardon the pun, but I chose the, the, the Guardian as the, the, the screenshot of this particular newspaper because Today, if you ask many Thai um, political operatives or even Thai voters or even some scholars, they might look at this not as a military coup that overthrow a regime uh, of government or a regime of democracy, but as an action by a guardian of democracy, uh, someone who comes in to cleanse the system to, um, to make sure that the corrupted politicians cannot basically um, um, uh, take away all, 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 all the uh, all, all, all the money in the coffers, in the people's uh, coffers. And that remains, um, 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 unfortunately, uh, a classic argument until today. And what we see throughout these long history of repeated coups are very interesting dynamic, the, the, the increasing dynamics of the, 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 the legal and political and economic powerhouses in Thailand, trying to create some kind of hybrid regime or some kind of co-opting co or co-action, or if I would be less charitable, a collusion of a system, as you can see from the important landmark of the 1997 constitution, we had what we called, what, what many scholars call the People's Charter. The first time we have um, 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 the, the fully, uh, a, a more or less fully representative uh, government. Um, for example, that the Senate is the first time that was uh, the Senate was being fully elected. Um, then came the, the coup in 2006 that produced the 2007 constitution. And we thought that this would pave ways to some kind of um, compromise uh, that could allow Thailand to progress towards a more liberal democracies, uh, according to those who proposed the, of course, the 2007 uh, version that says we need to slow down. Thailand is not ready for a full fledged democracy. Unfortunately, that turned out to be quite a propaganda because in 2014, uh, the latest coup in 2014 produced another document, uh, the so called 2017 Constitution. And if you look closer at these three versions, many things to cover, but in my 15 minute introduction, I think it's fair to say that we can just focus on one issue as an example, as a taster of these three versions. If you look at the 1997 version, you can see the People's Charter, uh, not only we created a whole bunch of provisions on the rights and liberties for the first time, we also introduced the fully elected Senate um, that became very controversial in the following years. But then again, in 2007, um, the promoters, the instigators of the coup 2006 say that's too much. It leads to a flagrant corruption because we have the elected Senate, the elected representatives, and they all collude um, against um, the, the national interest. So that's why when in 2007, a mixed system was introduced, we had a mixed Senate, basically half appointed, half elected. 
And it turned out to be quite a problematic situation because you can imagine sitting in the Senate together, you have half uh, of the members who consider themselves to be elected members and the other half who consider themselves to be a very special group of people who are carefully selected and they didn't seem to be able to work together. And that led us to the 2017 um, version with the unelected um, Senate in place. And you can see the color coding, the green color being that, okay, we're gonna go ahead with democracy, with um, the representation, then came the 2007 version with the yellow sign, perhaps we have to slow down and we are stopping uh, on this pathway towards um, a liberal uh, constitutional democracy with the unelected Senate among other key issues. And just to have a very quick look on these uh, structures, you can see that not only are they half elected, uh, no, sorry, uh, fully appointed, there are also special quotas for the military uh, establishment, uh, six positions in the Senate, the defense permanent secretary of the Royal Thai Arm, Armed Forces, the Navy, the Air Force, and the police, handpicked uh, through um, uh, carefully designed systems that allows the two instigators and the general prayer to make sure that at least um, the, the upper house, the Senate is very much a friendly uh, political institution. And it turns out to be the case. He was indeed um, uh, selected as the prime minister by um, uh, the, the party who backs him along with the Senate. And what is quite uh, interesting and should be noted, and I think is quite uh, up to date as well, is the role of the Senate. The role of the Senate has been particularly designed as the transitional Senate. The trans transitional Senate not only have the traditional Senate powers to review laws or to uh, consider legislations, but also critical roles in ensuring that General Prayut or whoever the regime uh, backs uh, can stay in power. And you can see the documents uh, uh, transcribed by the, the Secretary of the Senate that I highlight on the screen here, if you can see on the PowerPoint, that the Senate under the transitory provisions have the crucial role to drive the national reform and also uh, to participate in the selection or the so-called approval of the person who becomes a prime minister. What is notable about this transitional period is that it's gonna end quite soon because um, the, 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 the current version of the so-called constitution or what I would call the constitution of 2017 provides a period of five years and this period of five years actually starts from 2019 when the senators were uh, actually formally um, enters into office. So we are now at 2022. So it's only a matter of two years, very short period, um, until we discover what's going to be the political and legal landscape that these senators who back uh, General Prayut to become the, the, the current so-called prime minister what will happen to this transitional Senate? And I'm not at all surprised uh, to see that all the politicians uh, are now forming their parties and trying to form alliances because they know as one newspaper call is, is let the dance begin. They are starting to, 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 try, to try to find who to dance with to form uh, the, the, the next coalition to be uh, the power that backs um, the prime minister because it might not be a straightforward process like during the, the first five years. And let me just touch very briefly on the latest decision by the Constitutional Court, um, the so-called Constitutional Court that decides the fates of the Thai Prime Ministers. And you can see on the screen um, uh, that the gentleman, of course, um, um, you can see General Prayut there uh, on the left side of your PowerPoint screen, but on the far right-hand side, the gentleman pointing the finger and many political observers would dearly miss him for his wit and his charm, uh, so-called charm, uh, Mr. Samak Suntorowit. He was removed from office while um, serving um, the office of prime minister uh, for the infamous um, 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 uh, cause of going on TV to cook, a uh, uh, television cookery show. Uh, Mr. Thaksin Shinawatra, uh, we all know him, the former prime minister, the only prime minister in Thai political history elected to serve his full term, uh, also uh, faced a, a remarkable case since um, the early stage of his uh, prime ministership, the so-called Kadi Sukhun or the, the asset assimilation case that has to look whether he uh, fully and correctly reported his holdings in, 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 in private companies, in, in commercial activities. The, 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 as a successful business person, he of course transferred certain shares to certain uh, family members, certain uh, housekeepers, 
And remarkably, um, if you remember, that case came down to a split of just one single vote in the Constitutional Court. But this is very, very freshly from transitioning from 1997 version onwards. So that was uh, back in the year 2000. And of course, he survived by a merely one vote. So he, he, he actually um, uh, was found in favor uh, by the Constitutional Court. The lady Prime Minister Ying Lakshinawatra didn't survive, um, and the cause for removing her from office was staggeringly um, um, uh, dubious. Uh, basically, she was found to be acting uh, unconstitutionally by removing one of her advisors from office. The advisor was appointed by the previous political vote, the previous uh, political administration, which is something that we would find a bit difficult to explain. How would you expect a prime minister in office not to be able to reshuffle or to uh, move around the, the key advisors uh, who he or she might have trust more or less um, uh, as he, he or she carries on the functions. And the latest episode concerns General Prayut and Osha, which comes down to a basic uh, interpretation of how do we count the eight year term limit um, for him. And um, all of these comes down to the interpretations of the constitutional text, but also other legal considerations as well. And uh, my apologies, this document, this decision by the Constitutional Court was released just a few weeks ago without the English formal English translation. But basically what the court did, and I commend the court for this as a lawyer, uh, the court engaged in a rational textual analysis and tried to come up with the explanation why uh, the eight year period could not count from day one when General Prayut came into power. And the court basically rely on the text and the principle, the principle that is not written, but is a legal, generally accepted legal principle that there needs to be continuity, uh, there needs to be legal certainty, but also the overriding principle in this particular case has to do with the fact that the court cannot um, go over the textual limit according to the term when the actual constitution came into force. So basically the court used the period when the actual text of the constitution came into force, the current text uh, of the constitution as the starting point to look where, uh, how to count the eight year period. So basically General Prayut, he staged a coup before the constitution came into, into force, when before the current constitution was promulgated. And so the court basically says the overriding principle of law uh, does not allow the court to go back in time beyond uh, the power prescribed uh, to the court in this particular uh, document. So the time that Prayut served before the constitution came into force could not be included in the counting of eight years. And I must admit, uh, as a legal scholar who favors um, restriction of powers of the judicial functions, this in um, a parallel universe would make sense. It would make sense if we don't have to deal with the political coups, um, it would make sense for the court to restrain itself and resort to the separations of powers, the restrictive role of judiciary not to interfere into the realms of the constitutional limits and the power of the executive. Because by removing the prime minister from office, the court is actually exercising a very strong dose of judicial power. But that was not discussed at all. What, what, what was basically discussed was to look at the text and one of the many principles involved in this particular case, whereas the actual key consideration, the separations of powers what was not um, mentioned, the separation of, of functions, how the court should place its role in trying to ensure um, the, um, the proper functions of executive was not mentioned. And most importantly, in my humble opinion, the court basically ignores the total, the total cost of the spirit or the intention of the eight year period, the, the eight year period that bars a single person from serving a long-term uh, prime ministership exists for a particular spirit, particular reason. And that is to limit the powers to ensure that no one person can stay in power for such a long time to exercise the, 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 the high power office that might uh, impact the political and legal structure this unfortunately was something that is not discussed at all in this particular reasoning of this particular decision. And therefore, again, it leaves me with grave concern that there is a question on the sanctity of this decision, again, because of the reasoning, although looks nice uh, from, um, from these two pages, 
it's very much incomplete in my opinion. And it raised a question of the consistency as well, because when you look back uh, through the history of the court, the court has been very expansive, very liberal in trying to expand its judicial scope of power to remove prime minister for cooking on TV, using dictionary to interpret the, the, the terms of the constitution, um, to, to not to be afraid that the prime minister Ying Lak uh, could not reshuffle uh, or move around um, her, her advisor. So we have seen a clear pattern where the constitution court in Thailand has been very um, liberal, very um, pro-judicial in exercising its power. And it leaves a big question why in this particular case, it seems to be very restrictive in its own power. Again, uh, the, the cookery show, Mr. Samak Sun Torawet was removed uh, and uh, it, it, came, it came down to the word employee, whether he was employed uh, or whether he acted uh, in his own free time without receiving any payment. Uh, the court was also very liberal in trying to expand the scope of its power through other means. The foreign, uh, foreign policy scope is also another, another example when the court uh, added a term, you know, of uh, may, may change or not, does not change the territory to limit the power of the foreign minister in signing documents, which the prime minister argues is not considered a treaty, or even in the economic realm, and this is very interesting because now we are facing economic crisis looming, the court was not at all afraid to engage in economic analysis of its own, even, even though there is no constitutional basis to allow the court to act as the financial expert or act as the, um, as the um, minister of finance to decide which kind of uh, train, high-speed rail train project should be built or not, what kind of debts, what kind of uh, tax policy should be implemented. So the court has been very liberal, very, uh, very expansive in its interpretation of power. So it raises a clear question why in case of General Prayut, the court was so conservative in trying to limit its uh, scope of power when it comes to the eight year period. Another very remarkable case has to do with uh, the case concerning the amendment of the constitution. Uh, and this goes back to the year 2013. And again, this is something that I suspect will come up again as uh, the current Senate will be running out of this term in two years time. And there are current uh, proposals to try to come up with uh, the amendment of the current, amendment again of the current constitution. But look at this reasoning by the constitutional court in 2013. The issue back then was whether we should change the Senate, which is half elected, half appointed at the time to become a fully elected, a fully representative body. And I always find it amusing, if not sad, to have to read through this quote from the court to the students in the class. Because let's look at the screen now and let me read it um, uh, for, 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 for the sanity of legal reasoning. The court found that the amendment could not proceed. Why? The court ruled that such amendment to make the Senate fully elected would make the qualifications for senator too similar to qualifications for members of the House of Parliament and will allow those who control the parliament to also control the Senate, making the Senate, which is supposed to be an independent body, one that political sector, political sector may be able to fully control. So basically what the court was trying to say is that we cannot allow a fully elected House of Representatives and a fully elected House of Senate because then the people will elect the same groups of people and they will end up doing the same thing. And uh, whether that is political philosophy or political arrogance is, is something that we can discuss another time. But I suspect this kind of line of thinking will come up again and again as we have to go through the constitutional amendments. And similar reasoning is shown through various uh, examples. During the coup period, there was attempts to include these kind of very broad and uh, unclear language uh, that to, to prevent populism administration. So this is something that's written uh, in, in, the, in the interim constitution. And I suspect that this is something that will come up again as we have to deal with, um, with the, um, the situation on, on the constitutional um, um, crisis, the looming crisis with the Senate term ending. So I would just pose a quick question. How, how do we uh, understand or analyze these relationships or these um, um, uh, developments in Thai political history, the comparative uh, Thai political, political history. 
Again, some people would argue that this is the guardian against corruption. This is a necess necessary intervention to safeguard the interests of the nation. That's why we can allow these elected politicians to stay in power for a couple of years. And when things get out of hand, um, when they become too corrupt, the military has to step in. Whether that is true, we can, of course, debate at length, or whether this is some kind of guided or supervised democracy to allow Thailand to grow. Uh, and when, once it becomes ready, because the 1997 version of the constitution was too soon, too early, or whether this is a function of deep state, as some might argue that there is a hidden uh, system within Thailand, the elected government is just the puppet on the show, or is this something more elaborate? And I would call it a regime harmonization, if I'm going to be charitable, or is it a co-action, a collusion? And when I say regime collusion or harmonization, it is not only about the military, it involves the interpretations of the constitutions by the courts. It involves the uh, political and legal actors, economic actors, including those experts who help these coup instigators to ensure that they can design these elaborate uh, systems to, to stay in place. And it would not be enough um, to try to target General Prayut uh, or, um, uh, or the military. It would also, we need also to include actors in the media, in universities, um, um, in the in the, the banks in, in in the private sectors who benefit from these intervention and co-opted or colluded with the regime in trying to sustain um, um, the, the the system. So it comes back again to the central question: What's going to happen after the the current Senate term um, uh, ends uh, in two thousand? 24 in just two years time, are we going to have to see some kind of um, elaborate system uh, in place that we might have a, another version of mixed Senate? Are we going to go back to a fully elected Senate that doesn't have any power? Or are we going to end up with not having a Senate at all? And uh, the, the question will become clearer as we move toward the, the, the design of the system after the, the, the current uh, situation ends. And just to, a quick recap on what has happened over the past few years, there's been attempts by uh, mostly uh, pro-democracy activists and, and anti-regime anti regime political parties to come up with the attempt to submit the bill to amend the constitution. That attempt back uh, in June 2021 last year was denied. But uh, if you look at the latest headlines uh, from uh, uh, today, just a few weeks ago, there seems to be a growing, growing um, a call for the new uh, constitution again, uh, a new constitution, uh, ho hopefully not, but a new so-called people's constitution again. Senators, uh, of course, are not happy because one of the key contention is to remove the power of the senators to appoint the PM. Uh, and they might just want to serve that term until the, 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 the end of 2024. The good news is uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, if you look at this Thai headline from ILAW, which is a good source of information as well for anyone interested in, in, in Thai legal political studies, ILAW uh, on, on its headline says the uh, proposal um, 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 to, to propose a new constitutional amendment has now passed the reading in the, the initial reading in the lower house, but it requires the approval of the upper house, the Senate. But you have to ask yourself if the amendment itself is to remove the senators from power, is to remove the functions of those appointed senators, what would the senators say? And um, I think they are discussing that particular question this week and would be very interesting for us to follow through. But what I think is fine, what I find interesting is that there, there seems to be a growing uh, agreement among the at least the political actors uh, on the ground that things need to change because the senators who have been under the control or influence of the military, military regime simply does not seem to function in the interest of the political parties, even though those parties might initially back such regime. And I'm just going to finish with some political observations on what has happened. But before I do that, let me go through a quick uh, recap of the, 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 the current state of the 2017 uh, version or what I call the seven sins of the, 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 the current uh, 2017 version. We have a less representative parliament. Of course, the Senate is not representative at all. They, they, they are not uh, linked to the, to, the, to, the, to the electorals at large. We have a weakened electoral executive. And this is an important point. We have not seen 
the real uh, problem yet because so far since the 2017 constitution or constitution came into force, it's only General Prayut and his peers who has run the uh, executive branch. But imagine if we have an executive branch that is not seeing eye to eye with the Senate, that is not seeing eye to eye with the opposition parties, then we will start to see the, the, the powerful uh, weapons hidden in the text of the constitution coming out. And of course, those are number three, powerful unelected bodies with more powers and the hidden traps of ambiguity. If you are a lawyer reading through these uh, elaborate textual um, designs uh, of the 2017, it's longer, more complicated and includes even more ambiguous general terms, very broad asp aspirational terms that might cave ways for the court, for example, to step in and say, the government cannot do this, the government has to resign because of that. There are restrictions on rights and liberties due to state security, and of course, a very broad ethical standards, which have not been applied because General Prayut has been in, 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 in power since day one. So there's no really uh, a question by the, the people who were appointed to raise these questions. But things could change if we have let's say, a government who is not seeing eye to eye with uh, these unelected bodies. The sin number five would be the transitional guarantee to guarantee, like, for example, the Senate and to guarantee that there is a continuity from the coup regime to a so-called military back uh, civilian regime. And sadly, the sin number six is the impunity. Um, we still continue the sad tradition of uh, impugning those who staged the coups, who broke the law, who, who committed the crime to go on freely and even uh, become the, the next prime minister. And the last final sin, which again is something we are dealing with right now, is the difficulty of amending this text, uh, the difficulty that makes this constitution very difficult to amend. You have to pass through several hurdles. And now we are starting from a very, very difficult stage where we have to ask the people whether they want to amend the constitution. If they want to, they need to get the approval from the Senate, from the cabinet to, 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 to get involved. So there's a long road ahead uh, from, from the, the traps and the designs that makes it very difficult to amend. And lastly, just to finish on the political realities on the ground, you can see that through these political designs, um, uh, if you look at the electoral outcomes between 2011 and 2019, you can see it's not really changing anything except to bring in um, that the, the 2017 uh, uh, electoral design brings in smaller parties to take away votes from certain particular provinces, from certain particular groups. And you can see on the right hand side, these smaller parties are the ones who get together to support particular factions of the, uh, of the government or the opposition. But at, at the end of the day, the key strongholds in the north, in the northeast, the red colors being Kyrtai, or in the south or some areas closer to, to central Bangkok uh, for the Democrat Party. Interesting enough, Democrats have lost um, the, the ability to capture the, the, the support of the Bangkok uh, metropolitan area. So you cannot change political reality through, uh, the, um, the, through the law. You cannot, uh, you may be able to alter its pathway, but not the outcome. So what happens next? We have these um, uh, key uh, strongmen, General Prayut, the, the de facto, and I put a question mark because there seems to be rumors whether he wants to join a new party, not the Palang Prasharat party, but the two key allies, Democrat Party, Bhum Jai Thai Party, are also thinking what's going to happen in two years' time when General Prayut no longer has the comfortable support of the Senate. What happens uh, to me? Can I run as a small party uh, candidate and uh, and uh, engage in political dancing, political negotiations. We also see a complete change of tactics uh, from the Pure Thai Party to changing the leadership. You can see the lady here, Kun Ying Noi, Sudarat Geyurapan, who was one time um, the, 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 in the leadership of Pure Thai Party. Now she left the party and formed a new party. It, it, it's interesting to see the headline here because back in August 2020, so that's two years ago, it, there was a question whether her fraction would be the faction that gets to choose a candidate for the for the Bangkok mayoral um, election because Sudara traditionally has been the strong uh, the, the stronghold for, for Pure Thai's um, Bangkok, but Pure Thai changed its tactic. Uh, it did not formally uh, uh, name uh, Kun Chachat as the uh, candidate on the on behalf of Pyotai, but 
basically uh, de facto uh, support uh, Chat. And this is an interesting dynamic because Priyata is trying to capture the Bangkok audience. Chat Chat, although in the past have been involved in Ying Lak administration, he has complicated enough, distance himself to a certain limit to allow himself to be seen as a more or less independent from Pua Thai party. Whether that lives to be the case and whether the fact that he has now control, gained control increases popularity without relying on so much on Pua Thai, whether that would upset the, the Pua Thai party is something that is very exciting and left to be seen. The other interesting development or, um, uh, has to do with the, the, the smaller party that form as the future forward and disbanded and certain members then formed a move forward party. And my, 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 my general observation is that uh, we have to ask what happens if we don't have these two parties today? Of course, uh, progressive, uh, progressive um, issues might not be discussed as so much widely as they're doing, but by the same token uh, on the opposite side of the coin, uh, perhaps there are reasons for the military back regime to want to keep such small small parties um, of course they have to fight for the votes uh, in, in the up, any upcoming general election with the Pua Thai party or any fraction that is uh, running a campaign against the regime the military back regime so it's very complicated in nature and whether they survive any court cases might be for that partic particular reasoning and we can discuss this further if anyone's interested to chime in. And the last, uh, the last photo I think uh, has to do with this particular interesting uh, photo. You see uh, three persons here. Uh, you see Mr. Taksin Chinawatra, the the famous, infamous former prime minister, and his daughter, Hai Tong Tan Ung Ying, and also another businessman, a uh, property developer of Sansiri, uh, the uh, Mr. Seta Tawi Sin, uh, who uh, Ung Ying, the, 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 younger, the youngest daughter of Taksin and Seta are rumored to be uh, one of the two main uh, candidates uh, to become the, the, the next prime minister. And my concluding thought is this, if we are complaining or, or, or discussing ways to, to, to try to restore democracy, uh, one way is, of course, to address the direct problem, the, the coup, the courts, um, the, the regime, the, the problems of the law and politics. But at the same time, I think the political side that aims to achieve democracy has to demonstrate its capacity to be democratic as well. And it will be very interesting to see whether Pua Thai, Mr. Taksin, and the leadership in the party would be able to demonstrate that there is some democratic culture being developed or being demonstrated through these leadership uh, process. If you look at the process in England, in, in the UK, to become the leader of the Conservative Party, you can't just be the daughter of someone. You you can't even in the in the United States of America, uh, George W. Bush, who's the son of uh, the former president, his brother is a governor uh, of state of um, uh, important state. They need to go through process, uh, contention, a contest, a hosting, meeting uh, members of the party, get the proper votes uh, into account. And it would be very nice, at least, to see the, 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 the democ democratic dynamics being demonstrated through Pua Thai as we prepare for the next big battle, which might come earlier than two years. The Senate might stay in place for two more years, but I think the next two years will be very interesting to see how they shape and plan to demonstrate that this is no longer a family party or party under one person. But of course, the people who like to show, and this is from Pong Chandik, by the way, which is um, not a friendly media when it comes to Pua Thai Party. But again, it's a tactical headlining. Uh, it says Pua Thai's prime minister uh, is being appointed by uh, Mr. Taksin. So that's the, the narrative that is being formed. It is up to Pua Thai Party to demonstrate a counter argument that they can demonstrate some kind of democratic values within the party. And I think that's uh, something that I, I will, 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 will continue to observe uh, with great interest. And now uh, I turn back to, to Professor Tani. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll save questions and comments for the end after both the speakers. So our second speaker is Mr. Kravitz, who should be set up to join us now remotely. Oh, he's not able to join. Oh, who's not able to join us uh, remotely. So I guess we will go right to questions then. Um, 
the if I could ask as chair uh, one of the first uh, uh, or the first question um, when you listed the uh, general features of the 2017 Constitution, uh, it struck me that a lot of these are the same general features or could be seen as the same general features of the 2008 Constitution in Myanmar implemented in 2010. And certainly, um, uh, the situation in Myanmar is a front burner, and there's a relationship between Min Online and Prayut as senior mentor. I'm wondering which, to the, to the degree to which you can look at this in a silo within Thailand's context itself, or the degree to which they're looking at each other as they undergo these things, at least um, in terms of Ozzyman's response to 2021. Uh, um, uh, uh, February, uh, the uh, uh, what kind of limits is it set to what Prayut can do? Would Prayut be doing this, reacting the same way right now uh, if it had not been for the, the coup? Yes, that, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, back in 2014, when there were rumors of the coup, I had the opportunity to visit the United States of America to meet certain members of Congress, to meet some uh, certain members in the, uh, the US administration. And that's exactly the point I raised. And I said, you have to look at ASEAN as an interconnected region. You have to look at the political culture in ASEAN as one that influences the other, whether that might be a small or big influence. If the United States of America, and I'm talking in the context of communicating with a superpower, if the United States of America or even the EU or England is happy to continue to trade military uh, contracts with these um, uh, governments or regimes in, in, in these uh, region, and you start to see what used to be once uh, the beacon of democracy, a uh, hope during the, the at least uh, the fight against communism, according to the US version of narrative, you have to start to question that it could turn the other way around because the US precisely tried to engage into the, 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 the dynamics of political um, um, uh, dynamics in the region for its own interest, of course, no doubt, but because it believes that having Thailand as one of its key allies in fighting against um, the, the, the communist uprising back then would serve its interests. And I, I would argue it also works the other way around. If you allow these regimes to flourish, they will look at each other and say, well, Thailand still, the Thai generals still be able to sign documents and buy weapons. So why can't we? Um, so, but I'm not an expert on Myanmar, but I would say it raised a very um, uh, uh, problematic dynamics. Another key issue, I, I would say, is Thailand no longer enjoys the benefit that she enjoys 30, 50 years ago. When you look at Thailand before 1997 crisis, we are the best darling of the region, the, the, the prettiest woman in the room. When you are a foreign investor coming to Southeast Asia, you want to be in Bangkok. Uh, Singapore wasn't as uh, advanced uh, as today. Vietnam wasn't even on the map or discussion. But now the situation totally changed. Thailand is no longer the only prettiest lady or the handsome gentleman in the room. We might get in, be getting a bit you know, less attractive, in fact. So aside from the political and legal issues, when you look at the economic investment opportunities, that should create even more obstacles for such regimes to continue in the way that it has continued over the past decade. Thank you. Um, I would like to take any comments from questions from the room, if there are any. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I didn't hear you mention much about uh, people and whether the Thai people, the Thai population, or subgroups thereof, play any um, continuing significant role in the political evolution of the Thai state and the Thai uh, political institutions. Uh, from those of us looking from the outside in, although one us having roots and, and knowledge of Thailand historically. So the last time we saw the, the population on a significant scale um, stand up and seemingly say something about what they wanted was probably the uh, the demonstrations for the removal of, of Khun uh, Yenglak, when you had massive demonstrations on the streets sustained over weeks and I think even months. Since then, we've had a few uh, short, I, I would say it's seemingly short lived uh, demonstrations for this and that, more democracy, uh, uh, protesting to that, but they didn't seem to be sustained at all. But I'm just curious about your perspective on what role the population as a whole and, and popular 
groupings may have play on constitutional development and so on. Thank you very much. Because the microphone is here, I'd just like to recap the question whether the, the political realities on the ground, given that you saw a large scale protest during Ying Lak's uh, last days, but uh, there, there seems to be protests continuing under Prayut, but not in the, in the same scale. And I, I point you to this slide, um, to this particular slide from Thai Data Point, and I think it will be very interesting to study in detail. In my observation, I don't think after Thaksin Chinawatra became prime minister, I don't think the political landscape has changed in terms of the quantity. If you look at the Northeast, the North, um, the South, I think if you ask the people who voted for Thaksin um, back then, they will still continue to vote um, for the Thai party or whatever candidate they put forward. The change comes in the small, particular, specific provinces that might have uh, special uh, ways of handling their own elections. Um, so a, a small, smaller party might be able to gain votes in certain particular provinces due to special relationships. Um, but if you look at uh, the whole, I think uh, the, the, the mentality, the understanding, the aspirations have not changed. I mean, because let's not forget that it's Mr. Thaksin who came up with this policy, who um, he has been um, uh, regarded as the populist or the pro-democratic uh, prime minister, how will you look at it? What is interesting is in the Bangkok, the change has been developing more visibly in Bangkok. And this comes to the, the latest result with Mr. Chacha uh, Sitipan, who gained a, a huge, a huge landslide uh, uh, victory in Bangkok because the generational changes, more of the younger people seem to remember, at least I remember when I was a law student back in uh, 2006, getting so upset with the coup back then. I think there's a change there. And the traditional stronghold for the anti Thaksin um, uh, stronghold, the pro Democrat party, has changed. Now, come, coming to the protests, again, it comes back to the issue that I call harmonization or to be less charitable collusion. Because when Ying Lak was in power during her last days, I was one of the advisors to the government and I, I, and I looked at the attempt of the government to go to the court. Ying Lak asked the court, to the civil court, to order the protesters to go home so that there should be no violence because the police couldn't manage control them. So she went to the court, the court said, no, the court is not going to order the protesters to go home. She tried to declare a certain emergency legal actions. The court didn't seem to agree with that. And therefore it, it became so ironic that the court said, you cannot control these protesters up to the point that the military comes out and said, because you cannot control the protesters, the military has to stage the coup. So it's uh, a, a very sad irony uh, for that. When it comes to Prayut regime, of course, we see on the news the protesters, the pro-democracy, the younger protesters, they've been arrested, they've been uh, dragged out of the streets. So the situation, the collusion, co-action co uh, co by the legal regime, the courts, and the interpretations of these protest demonstration rights and liberties are very much in play. And I, I think that is one of the reasons why you can see the change in the voters' preference in Bangkok, because these protests are very much visible in the minds of the younger generation. And I think that is something that the Move Forward Party, the the Gaokla, is trying to engage with. At the same time, Pure Thai Party ends up playing two hands. Are we going to be seen as a more progressive pro-democratic version of the representation of the people? Or are we gonna use Gao Klai as the shield? If you want to talk about sensitive issues that is too progressive for Thailand, go to Gao Klai. don't blame on us because we have now Gao Klai as the, as the shield and we just continue to do the economic war, war on drugs policy, for example. And these dynamics will have to become more clearer and more in focus once we um, have to go on stage and the candidates get to debate. It will be very interesting to, to hear their thoughts regarding your questions in the next few years. Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to ask, what do you think the possibilities are for a potential, uh, another coup, say, in 2024, if there's some sort of political deadlock when this transitional period ends? Do you think that could be possible? And if so, um, what would the implications be of that? Yes, look at the screen. Yeah. And the answer is pretty obvious. You know, if you ask me, uh, when, I, when, when I was a law student um, in 2006, and I, I, I was so upset because we thought that we, 
we would have no more clues in 2006 we had. And when I became a lawyer in 2014, the same thought comes to mind. Um, it, it's not out of possibility, of course. What, what is going to be interesting is, and I think Professor Charlie can, can further add on this, we have to ask ourselves, why do the people who say the latest clue, why do they put a period of five years for the planet? Why don't they say 10 years or 70 years? Why five years? Do they have some kind of internal moral dilemma that, okay, we can't, you know, stage the BBD uh, charade for too long? And it comes back to the point where um, this is again back in 2014 before I left Thailand, and I, I, I coined the term the pseudo legitimacy. They want to create this pseudo legitimacy. They can't act in a way that would appear barbaric or um, uh, like a, a failed state. They need to have, okay, this is the Prime Minister, this is the Senate. We have only a transition period of five years, but of course, um, the constitution itself is defined in a way that it paved way for uh, smaller parties to come, come to four. And once the regime gets the control and the pollution by several actors, they might not even need the, the, the fully elected Senate to stage a practical coup in a sense that Gila, if there wasn't a coup before she was removed from office, but because she was removed from office, and she was going to fight for another election. That's when the coup came in. If the next prime minister, whether it's from Kuatai or whatever party, if they, if they, if they decide to play a softer role, and I, in my opinion, I think Kunila was so soft, so so soft and accommodating to to the protesters, to the military leader, leadership. If that soft wasn't soft enough, then we might have to go back to the older days, uh, pre nineteen eighty seven, when we have small parties. The prime ministers keep changing. There wasn't needed to be a coup every once in a while, but the prime minister couldn't stay in power and we don't move anywhere. And that could be another sad and tragic loss of the case. In terms of the um, underlying train not changing since, well, since the Red Chiefs, the Ultras, and that, that train is still there and having a myriad of smaller parties breaking up the uh, general public is in favor of, uh, of the regime of the underlying period. But one thing I was going to point out is that unlike uh, Unlike Myanmar, Thailand has another source of legitimizing legitimation of the constitution, which we aren't talking about. I respect that not my network to talk about that, but there are there is an additional institution to, to legitimate the constitution. Yes. So so this is this is a difficulty and also an opportunity because we know that they could have written in the constitution that the Senate has had to say in the transitional role for 10 years. But what would happen if it becomes 10 year period? The protest might get even stronger, the, the people on the street might get even more upset. The question of legitimacy, or what I call pseudo legitimacy, might come into question even further. So it's a game, it's a dance. It, 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 it's, it, it's like, you know, who's going to dance first and who's gonna, who are you going to dance with? So the, 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 the issue of tango is coming to an end in two years' time. So we're going to see, you know, how, how mix and match is going to come. But that presents it's difficulty, but it's also an opportunity. And that's why, and let me come back to this last photo that I put um, on the slide. That's why I really hope that there is some kind of dynamics um, to be shown from good high party. If it ends up being, oh, okay, Mr. Duxin, his daughter, and uh, someone that perhaps shared his CEO vision, but also shared certain connections with um, uh, certain parties that can, can help stabilize the government, if that becomes the narrative, then it's going to be quite an easy task for the opposition or the military to say, oh, okay, this is the old Thaksin regime story all over again. But if there is a new pathway that could I can demonstrate, that could present another chapter, another new interesting development in my politics. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit excited. I think it's my first time actually at the Art of Thai Politics um, on my campus. Anyway, I have two questions. Uh, first, it's going to be about our judicial mechanism that in the case of, you know, uh, the continuity of our uh, prime leadership, like how could you like, expand it? Is change the concept of liberal judicial places uh, in the past? And for the second question, it's about the upcoming election. Mm -hmm. So, the upcoming election, do you think it's going to be another military instrument uh, or what? What's your opinion about yeah. So let, let's take the, 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 the first question on, on General Bayou. He he's the one who's in charge because of his personality more than anything else, in my opinion. 
is the personality that that, that can distract um, the society at large from what is going on in Thailand. When you have questions about policies, questions about uh, economic crisis, he just shouts with the reporters and that becomes the news. And it has worked to an extent. Uh, if he's a prime minister who tries to explain things, he might not have to have the Bible for so long. And of course, uh, being uh, the, the person who stays true is the practical factor as well. Uh, but I think the people are getting get, getting up to, to, to the tricks, uh, shouting, acting in, 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 a, in a strange, funny, or disgraceful way. That's not that's no long that, that's no long no longer that's enough to distract uh, the, the the problem. And so that's why we see uh, certain disagreements and and certain fractions trying to compete for for the prime ministership. It goes back to the same point. What what would Kurt I do? Would Kurt I use the same formula? A personal popularity. Or are they going to use personal popularity based on a more democratic, more, more open process? But Mungi could end up being the next prime minister one day. But if she comes through a very open, very democratic process within the party that allows people to participate, that could add value to her time. But if she ends up being the daughter of Thaksin for that daughter status only, that's a completely different story. Now, what's going to happen uh, next in the election? It depends on those dynamics. Um, move. Forward party, Gaokai party faces very difficult situation. They have to fight for the seat. They have to fight with Kuatai. At the same time, they have to fight with um, the, the, the anti-progressive uh, movement as well. But again, it's interesting, isn't it? It's who you dance with and who you keep in the dancing room. Because without Gaokai, if the court is going to disband Gaokai tomorrow, what's going to happen with Gaokai's vote? It's probably going to go, some might argue, to, to other smaller parties. But a shun would go to the other side. So it comes down to, to, the, to, 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 to the, the political reality on the ground. And what I would mention uh, as a keyword is the law itself cannot change the outcome of political reality. It only alters the pathway, it only alters the time frame, but it cannot change the outcome. It might take longer than what we've seen in the past, or it would take a very short period, but the law itself cannot change the outcome. It only alters the pathway. Okay. And I think we have a question. Uh, yeah, we have two questions. I will I'll answer, uh, ask that and uh, do it all three. We'll do the first one first, and you answer, and then we'll do the second. Um, I would like to ask about the constant. Oh, this is Dr. Carlo Bernura. Uh, you know Carlo? Yes, hi, Carlo. Um, I would like to ask about the constitutional courts accepting the case against Priyut in the first place. What is your interpretation of this move by the court? Was this done in order to demonstrate um, the court was uh, following due process? Did it accept it in order to put Priyut on notice that he is not the choice of the um, quote unquote political establishment for the next election? Was it an instance of judicial autonomy within the established autocratic system? Or was it an instance of the further politicization of the judiciary where the court was poised to be the means uh, for a judicial coup? Yes. Uh, and I, I... Uh, thank you, Carlo. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think it's very difficult for me to to know what's the political reasoning behind uh, this case. As a lawyer, I can only uh, comment on what I read in the decision. But I think it's a legitimate question because um, precisely it goes back to the to the year two thousand when Mr. Tuxin was facing the the, the 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 case concerning his asset dissemination. And it's the same question whether this is political decision making rather than a legal decision making. And uh, it's very sad that we end up in this uh, situation where the, the, high, the highest court of the land deciding on the highest law of the land is acting in a way that is so uh, involved in the nature, in the course, in the pathways of politics. And it, it comes back to the, the same phrase I use. The law cannot change the outcome. The law only alters the pathway. And to Carlo's point, I think basically this is altering the pathway, sounding the support um, and allowing uh, General Prayut and his fraction to work out the arrangements among themselves. That's, of course, uh, speculation. I don't know. I don't have evidence for that. But uh, if you look at the de decision itself, it's very questioning, uh, Carlo. Um, uh, it's very questioning because it goes against the, the, the series of decisions that the court was so expansive in exercising its power, and suddenly in this particular case, it restricts itself to be very conservative, which I tend to like. I tend to argue for separations of powers anyway, but um, it raises a, a strong uh, series of questions why in the past, Kun Ying Lak reshuffled her security advisor, Kun Samak went on TV to cook, and the court was so expansive in interpreting exercising its power in this case. 
it became very restricted. So it raises those political questions, certainly. Yeah, and our second question is from uh, Prapapum Iam Sun. Uh, in your opinion, how will Thai politics break away from the Senate? Since it is difficult to amend the current constitution and the political landscape on the ground is basically the same, meaning Pua Thai party might not get the landslide, landslide victory um, they are seeking. Yeah, so, wow. Well, um, uh, you have to ask the, the political masterminds because you have to ask, in September last year, just one year ago, there wasn't a strong collection of votes in the lower house to propose constitutional amendment. But this year, the, the lower house seems to be able to gather enough votes to pass uh, through the initial stages, and then the Senate gets to decide. So something has changed. Something has changed over the past year that allows certain members of certain parties to, okay, in the past, I'm going to stick with Bayou, I'm going to stick with you know, the, the, the Senate, but it's no longer the case. Uh, or if they want to signal or, or use some political trickery, that's up to your interpretation. But I think People will start, when I say people, I say people who used to be with Bayut or the factor with Bayut today are starting to realize that there is another greater greener grass for themselves. They don't have to be stuck with this uh, former army general who goes out and shouts to, to reporters. They can see themselves as potential candidates, but to go through that loophole, they need to also join hands with a tie to deal with the Senate as well. So again, it's a political dancing. They may not be caring so much about the democratic legitimacy of the Senate, but they care that to have a more flexible or more open Senate seats, it could pave, part, um, pave pathways uh, for themselves. If that's going to be the case, then it would be very interesting political re rearrangements among the Thai Democrat Party, Kung Jai Thai Party, and you can see that the military regime will need to come up with the, with the bargaining ships as well. Um, to, to try to secure the votes. But at the end of the day, um, and, and perhaps uh, Mike, you can add on this, when you look at the experience of many countries around the world, the more you try to push down the political reality on the ground, it will spring up. It might not spring up today, it will bounce back uh, in a violent way, sadly, in some countries, uh, hopefully not for Thailand, but uh, I certainly hope we don't get to that stage. Perhaps Mike can add to- Well, not much more. I mean, when you push things underground, uh, all it does is just, keep the, uh, the elites oblivious to the realities on the ground, and then they pay for that later when there's a weakness, you know, as we've seen in Myanmar. Are there any other questions? We don't have any other questions online. Are there any other questions in the room? Because we've, we've actually done quite well for the, for the hour and uh, 10 minutes we've been going. So, well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to speak, uh, thank our speaker, Varapat, right now, es Esquire, because you're a lawyer. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank him for his talk. I apologize that we didn't have uh, the other speaker. That was due to Zoom. We'll fix that in the future. And thank for all of you for coming who have been in physical attendance and for those of you in the outside world and in Southeast Asia in particular for attending. It must be very late in the evening now. Thank you very much, and I'll call us to a close. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.